Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Hi, everyone. This is your host, Greg Myers. And on today's show, we have Alicia Zhu, the Global Head of Product for Dynamic Payments at Diebold Nixdorf. And this is episode 174 of the Leaders in Payments podcast. And more specifically, this is the second episode in our special Women Leaders in Payments Month. So, Alicia, thank you so much for being on the show today. Hey, Greg. First and foremost, I really want to applaud you for providing this a uh, platform in your podcast themed women in payments. I think it's a, such an important initiative for young women and executives to learn from each other. And I thank you for doing this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. My pleasure. So first of all, tell us a little bit about Dynamic Payments and Diebold Nixdorf, sort of the role that it plays in the payments ecosystem. Diebold Nixdorf is founded in 1859, Cincinnati, Ohio. So it's a little bit over 150 years company. It's American International Financial and Retail Technology Company with approximate about 22,000 employees with presence in about 130 countries. The company specializes in both hardware and software services. So the hardware primary around the ATM machines, POS, and physical safe. In addition, the software components will be some of software services for global financial institutions, retailers, and private sectors. So Dynamic Payments is a brand under uh, Depot Next Off, where we offer top tier one and two global financial institutions, payment processors globally. With our future-proof cloud native technology, we offer financial institutions, payment processors for payment solutions, including acquiring business, processing payments, and also issuing capabilities. And one thing I want to emphasize here about the dynamic payments is really it's about new innovative cloud native technology infrastructure we play here, digitalization and also the rapid react to the market and the industry. This is where we believe we can help our clients to uh, strive in this uh, dynamic world. Okay. And as the head of product for Dynamic Payments, can you tell us what your roles and responsibilities are? Absolutely. So my role unfolds into four elements. Number one, I really try to define the strategic vision and a strategy for our business and product. Second, it's really about the daily execution. It's really about our roadmap and deliver the promises for our clients. And the third is really define our strategic partnerships. So there are a lot of industry innovations, the payments really evolving very dramatically and really changing very fast. So we cannot do everything by ourselves. So we really leverage our partnerships who are really in a certain domain and to accelerate our roadmap, strengths, our capabilities in that front. And then last but not least, it is really about the go-to-market. So we have a lot of solutions in our very comprehensive platform. So the ability to commercialize our product and solutions and really fits to the certain market and the segments of our clients globally. Okay. Well, let's rewind a little bit and talk about your background. So where did you grow up and what was your life like growing up? I grew up in a countryside of Sichuan, China. Sichuan is really southwest of China, next to the Tibet, or very much in the inland, so surrounded by Himalaya mountains. What's well known about this region is it's really well known for two things. Number one is a very uh, cute, clumsy giant panda. And then the second one is very spicy, nummy food. So it's also part of my uh, root in my blood where now I've been in the U.S. more than a decade and wherever I go, I just cravings and looking for spicy food. The environment is very interesting where I grew up and when I grew up. So back in the days around the 80s and 90s, the country 
was undergoing the transformation in industrialization time. So it's really changing very dramatically back then. And I am one of the four daughters in the family. So the education back then was very competitive, where it's not like in the U.S. system where it's a kind of free to go to the college and to go to high school, etc. So back then in China, it's not mandatory. So you have to really compete to go to the college. So I went through boarding school and I was able to get into the uh, university in Sichuan. So very much equivalent to uh, University of Florida. Basically, it's one of the biggest state university. So back then, I remember the first very short period of time when I graduated from my college in China. And I stayed a very short period of time in one of the Italian-owned international import and export company, where we manufacturing all the lights for the motor vehicles. So I remember it was May 12th. At 2008, and I was working in my office, and usually my best buddy in my uh, in my office, another girl would be in the office with me. But on that particular day, she was outside for work. So I was working and very much focusing on printing my uh, shipping documentation. I was an import and export manager back then, and then suddenly. I just realized, you know, that my pen is shaking, the table was moving. For the first three seconds, I was like, what is going on? And then nobody was in the office back then. So it's about the 30 seconds. I was like, oh, my God, (laughs) this is earthquake. (laughs) So very short period of time in running through my mind is, should I hide under the table? Should I run? What about my uh, high heels? I was wearing, it's a summertime in Chengdu, so I was wearing a summer shoes with high heels and in bright red. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? <clears throat> and then three seconds later, and I found myself barefoot outside of the manufacturing. So it was a two floors manufacturing. I was on the second floor. It was a, such a life and death experience, to be honest. It was uh, very shocking because... For that earthquake back then, for Sichuan earthquake, it's uh, one of the most devastating earthquake in the history and hundreds of uh, lost their lives. It was uh, such an experience where really quickly after I realized also to my life as well, a lot of time we plan a lot of things since we're little want to do, want to become, want to do something or become someone when we grew up. But in reality, there are a lot of things is really going unplanned. I decided back then I wanted to really experience things in life, experiencing culture and learning new language, new things. So that's how I I, later on, I landed in the U.S. So when you were growing up in China, one of four children in the family, did you know what you wanted to do when you grew up? Did you know what kind of career path you wanted to take? Absolutely not. I thought I want to be an athlete because I, growing up, I was very active, but still right now. So I play sports a lot. Okay. And so you thought you were going to become an athlete. You had the earthquake, which kind of brought you to the point where you wanted to experience the world and you came to the U.S. So how old were you when you came to the U.S.? And besides the earthquake, were there other reasons that you moved to the U.S.? So... It was around my early 20s. I came to the United States um, to really primary focus in addition to explore the world. I was trying to get my graduate degree. So I mentioned earlier where I'm coming from is Sichuan province, right? It's very much inland. I was the weather wise is very similar to Seattle. So growing up, I was really craving for some sunshine. So I landed in uh, Sunshine State, University of Florida. Go Gators. <laughs> so you made the choice to go to Florida because you wanted sunshine. That's what I need in life, yes. <laughs> That's great. So when you were at Florida getting your, I assume, master's degree, what did you major in and what was your experience like at the University of Florida? It was eye-opening experience. So I majored in 
management in information technology in the UF Business School. The experience was very, still very refreshing, to be honest, because it was really first time I came to U.S. where my English back then was having some uh, challenges even on the regular conversations when I went to a grocery shopping for that extent. <clears throat> it was quite experience in addition to learn a lot of subjects and learn the language and the cultural in this land, I think above all, I think cultural probably was most challenging and also most rewarding learning curve for me. The graduate school really helped me to getting myself really out of my comfort zone. I deliberately going to make friends with somebody whose first language is English and who does not really speak my native language so we can practice my English speaking skills back then. And then another thing in that college experience in UF was so I was majoring in information technology, even in the business school. But the reality is women in business and technology is minority. I remember in my class, we had about 15 women among 45 men in my class. So it is very natural, you know, for a lot of times that in addition, we have a lot of international students as well. So a lot of international students tend to be really much like to stay in their comfort zone. You know, they like to cook together, they go to grocery shopping together, they go hang out in Orlando together. That's the experience I had, and that's what I noticed. And you mentioned earlier, and I wanted to sort of double click on it, and you said that being an athlete was something that you looked forward to and that you stay active now. So what do you do now? What are your personal hobbies and passions? What kind of working out and stuff do you do today? A couple of things I do when I'm outside of work. So first, I really love running. May not be become an athlete of play tennis. That would be perfect, but I was able to <laughs> run a couple of uh, marathons, including start with a Disney marathon in 2015. I did New York City marathon in 2017 and the Chicago marathon most recently in 2019. I really find that the running is a my preferable form of the meditation. It helped me to really calm and reach stress release. I will say running really keep me sane. And then my passion is actually really dancing. So I used to be a semi-competitive Latin dancer, believe it or not. <laughs> I had to stop because of the pandemic and also because of my uh, current executive MBA with uh, Columbia Business School and London Business School. I joined the program since last year in May, and I'm expecting to graduate later this year. So with the school, this is a very, this is a global program. So what that really means is I go to the campus for both Columbia and also for London Business School in New York, in New York and also in Dubai. I take classes in those cities and continents. And also because of this program, I got a chance to, you know, go to some of the areas, which is part of my cohort. Like say, back in March, I was in Saudi. April, I was in Pakistan. It was quite an experience where you are going to some of those cultural environments where it's very fascinating, especially for women in those countries and where you hear that in the media versus you go there and see that in person. It was very shocking. It was a absolutely rewarding experience as part of this program. I also travel a lot because of my current role for my team. And we travel to India, Germany, and the Netherlands earlier this year in March. I was in India and then after I was in Germany and Netherlands for business. So between my work and the school and getting really busy, but luckily, I will say I'm very fortunate to have my manager support in terms of my MBA and my team's backup when I'm out of office. So tremendous support from my professional work and in addition to my partners as well. Can, I can't say I can do this without my partner support, you know, personally. Funny thing is when you get so busy between your, uh, your MBA and a full-time job, I just I remember so many weekends and evenings that uh, either I'm working on my 
work emails or I'm working on the school finals. I'm actually have a final deadline tonight. And my partner often, you know, sometimes he would tease me, say if I remember his name, <laughs> but in reality, he's very supportive. That's great. So no more time left in the day for any dance competitions. Maybe after my school. <laughs> well, great. So you talked about having your first job. I believe it was your first job as an import-exporter. So maybe walk us through your career journey from that point forward, or maybe when you graduated from grad school, maybe you get that point to where you are today. Just kind of walk us through your career progression. In reality, I really consider my like career really journey, I would say, began after my graduate school in the U.S., right? That's where I really expanded my horizon in terms of professionally and building the network and also the life in, in the States. So the career started in J.P. Morgan, where I was very fortunate to secure a couple of internships when I was still in the U.F., one semester before I graduated. And from that, a uh, couple of those internships, and one of them being JP Morgan. So I stay with JP Morgan for summertime. And then soon after the summer internship, they actually offered me the part time job while I was trying to finish up my grad school last semester. And then right after the graduation, they offered me a full time. So that started my officially first job in JP Morgan, you know, one of those largest bank in the world. And then I was in corporate banking in core payments, corporate banking and payments in that function, stayed about five, six years. And then right after that, I moved on to back then was first data and then later on become Pfizer. So you go from one of the biggest banking sector, goes move on to one of the biggest fintech and payment processor space. And now I'm in uh, DN, it's another very uh, big fintech firm where I'm really heading the uh, task with transforming the company from the hardware and focusing on the software space. So if I really rewind my career progression, it is feel like from the very first role in JP Morgan, I was like um, deployed in ACH department in JP Morgan. And since there, I was into core banking payments. Then you, in first data phase serve was that I did the mobile payments. I worked in the merchant service space. And now in my current role, which is all above for our platform, that's comprehensive our platform is. So for my career, if you really look at it, it's like, see, I call that 360 degree above payments. So in that space, one thing in all this career progression, I think one thing I, I have observed and learned is that in the banking and fintech space, and women are really, really minorities. I was preparing this podcast. I was checking what's the industry feel like in terms of women executive in a different sector. And then the banking fintech sector actually is second lowest women executive representation. It's about 12% is the lowest being energy sector. So this is something, like I said earlier, I mean, especially for women when they become more senior, it's even more challenging. So that's really circle back to Greg for your platform here. I think it's the amazing thing you do. I actually didn't know that it was the second to the lowest. I knew we had a long way to go, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more in a minute. Let's go ahead and switch gears and start talking about women leadership and more specifically women leaders in payments. I think it's a good segue. So for you personally, what are some of your guiding principles? What are some things you sort of use as day-to-day -day ways to manage your leadership skills and your team and things like that. So I kind of lump them all into guiding principles. So can you talk about that a little? I will say being authentic with growth mindset. I think when we all need to know as a women and what truly who we are and what we want in life. And with the world is going so fast, we want to keep open-minded to learn as much as we can. I think that's very appropriate for everyone in business, but I agree that we all have to learn and understand and have goals. I think it's a great way to think about things. So who inspired you along the way? So did you have mentors? Are you a mentor? Can you talk a little bit about mentorship and your view on that? I will say my parents growing up, 
as my uh, inspiring and my mentor personally. The reason I'm saying that is so going back to what I mentioned earlier about the situation back then. So I'm the youngest among four daughters. So my dad is breadwinner for the family, work hard, travel the world. I think what really uh, made me feel like he's is such a big image in my mind is he back then in China, where back then one child policy still remains right, back around 1890s. And also like boys were favored back then than girls. So among all those, and he was basically against the current race with my mom and raised the four daughters in the family. It was incredible. I mean, for my mom, she's an example of very tough and fair. And she often, she teaches me always since I was young, be independent. And the one thing I remember one day in the evening, she looked at me and she was like, if the opportunity presents, she would love to be educated and wanted to go to work because she wanted to be very independent. The fact is back then for women, for her situation back then was not uh, allowed to. So she had that hope in me and teaches me to do so. And it has been always in my life. I will say apart from that professionally for the mentor wise, I think since I was in UF, especially coming to this very foreign environment along the way, since school and first job and Pfizer, I had multiple mentors along the way. One of the most recent mentor is one of those very senior executive in Pfizer. He helped me so many ways in my career because back then I was a woman. I think my situation was where I was rising to become senior and I was a turning point of my career. And he was in that point of time, he was right there to provide me a lot of guidance and expand my network. I was able to learn some new businesses and met other senior people. So that was very significant until today. And last night I was uh, reaching out to him and thank him and we reconnect to catch up again. So absolutely, I mean, along the way, I always have mentored depending on the different career stage. As to give back, I also been a mentor many, many ways. I was a mentor in UF where as I get secured multiple internships and about to be in my professional career, I was mentoring some of the women in the college and trying to learn how to get into the uh, professional work, how to secure some of the professional development or job of the internship and provide some of the tips, et cetera. And then at the work as well. So as I get senior, a lot of uh, young professional uh, women, they were reaching out because they like to hear what's my experience and how where they can learn and grow. And I often, I also learn a lot from them as well. As a matter of fact, last weekend, I was actually in Santorini where I was staying this uh this cave, the lady who was my neighbor back then, and we start to talk because we were both sitting outside. We start talking and I realize that she actually raising a senior and study in NYU. What a small world. Come to a, a Grace and Centurini to meet your neighbor. So we start talking and she was saying her questions around whether she should stay in that uh, internship. So she secured an internship with a bank in New York with being an investment analyst. But her question was whether she should stay after that internship, but she's explore. So we start talking and then after 30 minutes conversation, she asked me my phone number, she asked my LinkedIn information and she wanted to catch up, ask me questions and ask me to be her mentor. So it is a great experience. So yeah, have a mentor along the way, your career, different stage, absolutely is very helpful. And often we all need to also be a mentor for others as well. I would agree. And oftentimes mentorship doesn't have to be this prescriptive program. A lot of big companies and things have programs, right, where you're prescribed into this program or whatever. And I feel like you gave a perfect example where 
you became a mentor just through a conversation sort of almost randomly. And I think people don't realize that, don't think about that. But I think that's something that happens and can happen. It doesn't have to be a formal program or a group that you get together with. It can, can happen very naturally. You also talked about leaving China, coming to the U.S., wanting to see the world. I mean, all these things you've done, in my mind, I kind of can frame them around getting outside of your comfort zone, right? A lot of people talk about that. And obviously, you've done that. I mean, coming here, not speaking English that well and having to, like you said, even going into the grocery store and stuff. So what are your thoughts on that about getting out of your comfort zone? Can you speak to that for a minute? Absolutely. I mean, you're right on, Greg. Exactly. I feel like I think in life, it's really all about, I mean, it's a little bit exaggerated, but life is all about getting out of your comfort zone. And that is really to drive you to learn and to grow. Like you mentioned, right, the moment I landed in the United States, that's already going way out of my comfort zone. But I will say, you know, the learning should never stop. And now I'm really stretching myself where in my current role, and I'm also uh, trying to uh, complete my global executive MBA with Columbia Business School and London Business School. It is very much getting out of my comfort zone as well. So I learned it's really challenging and a rewarding experience, learning some of the subject I really don't think I knew before very well, and learning to travel to the countries and regions and I would have never thought I would have. Like I mentioned earlier, I went to Saudi and Pakistan. Those are tremendous experience and then cultural immersement in those environment. It was a very, very rewarding traveling experience for sure. And then last about getting out of comfort zone, I feel like I can't remember how many late nights and evenings and weekends that I really stretched my go. I stretch myself to either work on my work emails I need to catch up or work on my finals. It's really about getting out of your comfort zone and that's how we learn and grow. Yep, totally agree. So what do you think is one characteristic that every woman leader should possess? Confidence, confidence, confidence. Oh, that's three yeah. words. <laughs> I think female leaders really need to be confident in their own abilities. So what are you doing? I mean, obviously, you have put yourself in situations to get out of your comfort zone. But in order to continue and grow as a leader, I mean, obviously, you've made career moves to increase your responsibilities and, and you're sort of in this global head of product role. But what do you do day to day to ensure that you're continuing to grow and develop as a leader? I would say... Surround yourself with diverse and international networks. Travel extensively if you can and always maintain your learning curve. Yeah, that's good. And then sort of, and you mentioned this early on, sort of the purpose of me highlighting women leaders in this space and trying to elevate the awareness that we need more diversity, we need more female executives, females on boards of directors. I mean, that's kind of the message that I feel like this is the third year that we've done this is trying to elevate that. I feel like people who have progressed in their career can provide some advice for the next generation of female leaders. So if you were talking to people, maybe at your company or even outside your company that are maybe more, it's their first job out of college or second or they're younger, what specific advice would you give them to help them be successful in their careers? Don't be shy. Get out of there to uh, try as much as you can and learn from your own mistakes and learn what you like and what you don't. I would say you are in charge of your own destiny. Yeah, I love it. I love the taking some personal responsibility. You talked about this earlier. I want to dig a little deeper and get your thoughts on it is the fintech payments, banking, however you want to sort of label them or lump them together. We have a ways to go in female representation. What else do you think we could do as an industry? I think it has been improving since a decade ago in terms of female representative and female executives. 
I would say that the industry could do better, hire more women, promote more women. The reason I'm saying that, I think about three weeks ago when I was in the industry conference, Money 2020 in Amsterdam, where you can see a lot of those. I mean, this year, I see the industry has significantly improved in terms of the conference deliberately to promote women where you will see different type of the speaking sessions or at the focused topics where they will be focusing some portion, a selective portion of women in this session of money 2020 for the industry. But for the uh, some of the conferences back then, I think compared back then, this year is so much better. So like I said, if industry has evolving, has gone so much better in terms of promoting women, a representative in this industry, but I think we could do better. Yeah, I would agree. Well, one final question for you, and I actually have taken this question from another podcast that I like to listen to called How I Built This on NPR. And the question is, how much of your success do you attribute to your hard work versus luck? I will say 90% of hard work and 10% of luck. If that's a luck, I will say that's really a timing and an opportunity for that 10%. But majority, I will say, is like I said earlier, you're in charge of your own destiny. So it goes to a lot of hard work preparation. I love that sort of taking your personal responsibility for your career. And I think we've all heard it before. The harder you work, the luckier you get. So I think you make your own luck, right? I mean, luck is uh, luck is supposed to be a random thing, but I think you in many ways make your own luck. Well, Alicia, we've covered a lot of ground today on your background, your career, your views on women leadership. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? I think... I really wanted to reiterate how much I appreciate this platform and the opportunity for this month's women leadership scene you have. I will say I also very appreciate my current company for the opportunity to share my stories. If anyone is interested in the details of what I do and what our business to how we help our clients, feel free to uh, reach out to me in LinkedIn. So for people to find you on LinkedIn, can you spell your name where they can find you on LinkedIn? Alicia, A-O-I-X-I-A, last name, Z-H-U, Alicia Zhu. You can find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. Why? Well, I hope some people will reach out to you because I think you can uh, definitely be helpful in, in their careers. And if they want to learn more about the company too, I, I hope they'll reach out. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time's very valuable, so I want to respect that. But thank you again for being on today. Thank you, Greg. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 